Welcome to the Your Mom on Drugs podcast. You've got me, Josh Klaus, the son, and the mom, Jennifer Seltzer. Hi, everybody. Yeah, uh, this is a podcast uh, basically about drugs, um, usually the kind that you take over the counter um, or ones prescribed to you by your medical professional um, or by your local pharmacist. And uh, we just thought it would be a really good idea just to talk about, you know, when you put something into your body, like what's actually going on and one of the best times to put that thing into your body. Um, and so we just wanted, my mom is a, a doctor of pharmacy and I, she always gave me great pharmaceutical advice. And so I always thought it'd be a really great idea uh, to share her knowledge uh, with the world. And so here we are sharing the knowledge uh, with the world and we hope that you find it useful um, and today we're going to be talking about allergies, which is a huge topic. It's very broad. We're going to be talking about a couple of specific um, allergic conditions, um, but we're going to give a broad overview first. And so I'm going to turn it over uh, to my dear mother, who's going to kind of give an overview of allergies. So mom, if you had to describe allergies to someone on the street, someone like me, how would you describe allergies? I think just generally a, a person needs to realize that an allergy is a, a particular person or their body's response to something that's normally considered harmless. So, and we don't necessarily know initially to expect that we're going to have an allergic reaction to something. I mean, it's an exaggerated immune response to uh, something that's kind of benign. Um, and it's, and actually I thought this was really interesting as I did my research, it's really the immune response. It's our body's response to that and what we call an antigen or the allergen, but it's not the actual allergen that's harmful to the person. Oh, okay. So it, like, so I know a lot of people complain of things like pet dander or in here in Texas, we have cedar fever, which is something that people really complain about. Um, so it's not the actual thing that you're breathing in or touching that's causing the problem. It's something else. It's right. It's your body's response to it. Okay. Okay. Um, which I thought that was really interesting because if you have known anyone that's had an allergy to something and you talk to several people, their symptoms can be varied, you know, based on the way that their body is responding to that particular antigen or allergen. Gotcha. And a couple of episodes before we've talked about things like the common cold and we've talked about conjunctivitis, AKA pink eye. And these are things caused by things like bacteria and viruses, which Normally, when someone is infected with a virus or a bacteria, it usually affects the same type of, I would say, most people in a similar way. Like for someone to get a common cold, it's usually going to affect people in a similar way. But not everyone who breathes in pet dander is going to get a severe allergic reaction. Absolutely right. So it's going to be dependent on a couple of things in your own body that are going to be responsible for this reaction. Yes, that is true. So... Um, what are some of the things that are going on inside of your body? Um, I, I, I remember reading too, I think that there are a couple of different types of, of allergic reactions. I remember there's one that's associated with this, um, this chemical called IgE, mm -hmm. um, and that stands for immunoglobulin, which is, uh, essentially it's an Im immune mediator. Um, it, is globulin kind of, if you can picture something almost like a globe and immuno sending for, uh, you know, the immune system. And then there are many different types of these, and this happens to be type E. Um, you've also got IgG running around, IgA. Uh, hey, there's IgA. Um, just, IgM. Uh, yes. know, so, yeah. I don't know how they name these things, but they got their names. And um, so IgG, IgE is associated with allergic reactions. And there's also other types of allergic reactions that aren't associated with IgE. And those are things like um, topical uh, dermatitis. So like things like poison ivy, like you actually don't get a lot of IgE released in those reactions. So I think today we're going to probably focus on things happening with IgE, the stuff that happens inside of your body rather than on the top of your skin. Um, so mom, you want to 
fill in any more information. I'm going to, I'm going to try to like briefly cover, you know, all the different types of allergic reactions that can happen, but we're really going to focus more on what we label, um, immediate, uh, hypersensitivity reactions or allergic reactions and delayed hypersensitivity reactions. Yeah. So something can happen right away or it can happen a few days later, oh, hours to a few days okay. later. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. So let me just kind of dive in a, a little bit as far as kind of how an allergy can happen. Um, when, when your body comes into contact with what we call the allergen or we call it the antigen as well too. So it's going to be the thing that comes into your body that maybe your body has not seen before. It can sensitize or prime your immune system because it's your immune system that is going to give you the response if you're going to have an allergic reaction. So then if you get exposed to that same allergen or antigen again, that's when you're going to see the allergic reaction. Um, so sometimes it may happen in seconds, minutes to hours, where other times it could take hours to days to see that reaction. Um, the one that when we see that immediate reaction, as Josh was talking about, is usually the one that has IgE, um, that we see those levels raised. They can be your anaphylactic reactions too. Um, you know, where you, you know, they can sometimes be life threatening and we'll get into that in just a minute. Um, and, um, so what happens is that IgE will bind to things in your immune system called mast cells and basophils, and they will release what we call mediators, such as things like histamine. Everybody's heard of histamine or antihistamines. And so when you get a bunch of histamine released, then you can start having some symptoms. Yeah. And some of those symptoms as people who maybe have experienced an allergic reaction before is that you can get some vasodilation, which means more blood rushing to an area, which means it kind of means like swelling. So you might feel some uncomfortable pressure or you might get some bronchoconstriction, which makes it a little bit harder to breathe. Um, also some mucus. Uh, production being increased as well. Right. Runny nose yeah. and um, it, redness, you know, and stuff. So. And I know y'all were, th were throwing a lot of information out there and we just want to let you know that, you know, this is to our best understanding and to any scientist's best understanding. This is not a definitive answer. Um, you know, basically the immune system is very complicated. Uh, imagine when, let's imagine you're ordering something on Amazon. And you click, I want to buy this toothbrush. And you click buying the toothbrush. And all of a sudden, the toothbrush appears. Do you think the only two steps involved were you clicking that button and then the toothbrush appearing? Absolutely not. There's tons of stuff happening behind the scenes that you're probably unaware of. The person driving to work, the person going to pick up the toothbrush from the bin, the person putting that toothbrush in the truck, etc. You know what I mean. So anytime you have a stimulus, a.k.a the 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 allergen and the response which is feeling the allergic reaction there might be one two or hundreds of steps that happen in between and sometimes understanding those steps is really important to understand what type of therapy you might need whether it's pharmaceutical whether it's lifestyle change whether it's even something in your house such as like a better filter to filter out more antigens because mom i was going to say like you know, I've been hanging around pets all my life and I've never gotten a pet allergy. So it seems to be that certain people, maybe with elevated IgE levels just due to genetics or sometimes even bad luck, like sometimes this cascade can just be triggered and they can get allergic reactions, correct? Right. That's right. So, <laughs> And there's something really interesting. Sorry, to, I'm, then I'm going to let my mom continue on. There's something out there called the hygiene hypothesis, which is... Um, as countries, especially in the West, places like Britain, Denmark, the U.S., et cetera, as we've gotten cleaner and richer, we've basically removed ourselves from the outside world that we've cohabited with for, you know, tens of thousands of years. And things like parasites and different bacteria that normally live in our body don't live in our body anymore. So our immune system isn't used to fighting something off. And so in absence of that, 
instead of twiddling its thumbs, it's thinking, well, what can I attack? And it basically attacks things like peanuts or the, or it's something like pet dander, things that are normally harmless in an environment, but in such a clean, pristine environment, your immune system isn't smart enough to say, oh, that's foreign or that's good. It is literally just ready and primed to go. So there's actually current literature out there that actually exposing kids or young, you know, young people to a various array of, of substances that are normally in the natural environment might actually help diminish some of these allergic conditions later in life. But you kind of have to do it early on. Uh, unfortunately, when you have them, it seems like you're kind of stuck with them into your adulthood. So I just wanted to put that out there. The hygiene hypothesis is a really interesting one. Um, the idea that we've just become a little too clean, uh, but there's trade-offs for everything because we also don't have to deal with uh, river blindness or um, dengue fever, for example. So uh, I would much rather trade dengue fever uh, for maybe some hay fever, if that's the case. But I also don't have to deal with hay fever. So maybe I'm speaking on a turn. Sorry for anybody out there who's dealing with hay fever. So enough with me talking. So mom, would you continue on? You were talking about mast cells and histamine and being released in your body. Right. And that was really part of what we call the immediate or sometimes the anaphylactic allergic reaction. There's also a delayed allergic or hypersensitivity reaction. And that is really T cell mediated. We have T cells inside of our immune system as well. And they are going to activate what we call interleukins which are really powerful um, mediators of an allergic response. And so again, we had the IgE with an immediate allergic reaction. We've got T cells in a delayed reaction. And it just takes them a little bit longer to get activated. That's why it can be hours to days before you see an allergic reaction with a T cell mediated allergic reaction. Yeah, just to give you an idea, T cells are actually cells. And so they're much larger than IgE, which is just, just a protein. So sometimes it just takes a longer time for that T cell to move to where it needs to go just, just due to physics and size. Yes. And so just um, let me give you two other, um, just, we're, we're, I'm just, just for completeness, let me give you two other uh, types of hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity or allergic reactions, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on these. One is called cytotoxic hypersensitivity. And this occurs when the antibody directed at those antigens or allergens of the cell membrane, they act activate our complement system. And so this is going to cause a, it's called what a, a membrane attack complex, or it's kind of like cytotoxicity where the cells are kind of attacking, you know, the body and stuff. So um, and they'll literally attack your own tissue, right? Right. And so, I mean, you can see this in some drug, um, allergic reactions, and you can also see it too in some, uh, if, there, if some things happen um, when you get certain infections, like um, you could get hemolytic anemia, and that that you can get hemolytic anemia, and um, and that would be due to this cytotoxic hypersensitivity. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that, though. Yes, and you said there was one more. One more is called immune complex hypersensitivity. And this is when that antigen antibody complex causes an inflammatory response in tissues. So the difference between that cytotoxic um, hypersensitivity reaction and this immune complex cytotoxic um, or hypersensitivity reaction is that with the first one, the, the allergen is bound to a part of the cellular membrane. Um, but in the type three, I mean, I'm sorry, with, but within the immune complex hypersensitivity reaction, the, the allergens are freely circulating so they can go, you know, in different places. And that particular type of allergic reaction is, um, is going to be commonly seen in maybe more complicated things that we see like serum sickness or, um, um, just other se more serious uh, things and stuff. So just for completeness, I wanted to mention those as well. well. That's good. Okay. So we have immediate allergic reactions, which deals with IgG. Yeah, IgE. IgE, thank you. Then we have long-term or basically delayed yes. allergic, which deals with your T cells. Yes. And then we have um, 
we have the cyto cytotoxic cytotoxic which deals with uh it's an internal problem which causes cells to essentially attack other cells or your tissue so for example they might attack lung tissue for an example because they get confused and they might attack their lung tissue and cause damage there yeah or you have the um the the immuno complex which right. is the the idea so it's not local it basically spreads through serum aka blood and and lymph and, and other fluids yes and causes some sort of an inflammatory you know reaction things like histamines and so they'll be get carried around the whole body because they're going to be in the bloodstream right okay but i'm thinking the ones that we as you know our cells would deal with most commonly where are going to be those immediate hypersensitivity reactions or those delayed hypersensitivity reactions. So, and again, the things, the, somebody might be thinking, well, what all causes allergic reactions? And there's a list and, and this won't be an uncommon, I mean, this will be a familiar list to most people. So pollen, big, big one, mold, animal dander, dust or dust mites, which people are certainly aware of, latex, anybody that's had a latex allergy, that's definitely part of an allergic reaction. That's been a, a kind of a newer allergic reaction. I'd say though, it's, it's probably now 25 or 30 years old, but it's definitely a newer one. Um, me medications, um, insect stings and bites, uh, foods, different foods, such as shellfish, eggs, milk, tree nuts, peanuts, and wheat. Those are the common ones. Chemical irritants can also cause an allergic reaction and things like poison ivy, poison oak, and poison sumac. So you, those are, that's the, the pretty much the common list of allergic uh, allergens that cause an allergic reactions. Those are the low hanging fruit. They might affect most people. Right. And the, there's a stat out there that 25% of people experience some type um, of allergic reaction. Um, and that's 25%. Um, I, I believe that's either America or that's of the world. Uh, but if you use America as a sample population, uh, then, you know, it's 25% of almost 8 billion people. So that's about 2 billion people, which is pretty amazing. There you go. So, um, so let's, let's, let's talk about an example because I think a lot of people um, maybe either have these allergies or they don't. Um, I think a common one um, is hay fever. Um, and so I think you're going to be talking about that, right? I let, Yes. Let me, there's just a few other little details I just wanted oh, to yeah, throw in course. here. First of all is when we talk about those immediate hypersensitivity or allergic reactions, the things that can commonly cause those immediate type reactions are things like pollen, different foods, bee venom, and medications. So those are common for that allergic, and th that's going to that's going to come into play in just a minute as I talk about symptoms. And by immediate, we mean within minutes, minutes to hours. Okay, minutes to hours. Whereas those delayed hypersensitivity reactions may be more commonly caused by bacteria, fun fungi, chemicals, or plants. Okay, so you think you think well, how do I know if I'm having an allergic reaction? So the common symptoms that you see are going to be sneezing, a runny nose, maybe obstruction of your nasal passages, um, itchy, watery eyes. Uh, you could have eyelid swelling. Um, you could have itching, just all body, all over, all over body itching. Interestingly, too, you could have stomach pain or diarrhea to go along with an allergic reaction as well. Um, and so those are typically manageable on your own, but the things, the ones that you want to be worried about are the ones that get more serious. So anytime that you have, uh, have been exposed to some sort of an allergen and you have anything like uh, difficulty breathing or your lips or your tongue start swelling or you have hives all over or you start having pale, cool, damp skin or you've got a fast or pounding heartbeat, you have significant nausea and vomiting, or you feel um, drowsy or confused or you faint, you're going to probably want to get some help. You, sometimes it's a 911 call, um, especially if somebody's having difficulty breathing. So you need to be aware of that, you know, and, and sometimes people need to wear medical alert bracelets that, let, that tell, you know, anybody else that you've got an allergic reaction, a severe allergic reaction to something. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, that's tough to say because if if you don't know you're allergic to something, you're going to find out in that moment. Which is crummy, yeah, but right. there are some ways to diagnose allergies, you know, especially when they're not that severe, but you can um, certainly by symptoms, you can tell whether or not you're allergic to something. If, if you had never, you know, been fine and all of a sudden you do something and you have some of these symptoms, you can feel pretty certain that maybe that was the cause of it. You can also, um, see an allergist and do things like the skin prick test where they will, they will, um, give you small little, you know, substances, usually I think they do it on your back and see whether or not your body reacts to them to help you figure out whether you are allergic to cats, you know, or you are allergic to, uh, uh, pollen from cedar, you know, and that, that kind of thing. Um, you can also do, if it's foods that you're having issues with, you can either do a food elimination diet or you can do a food challenge test as well too. Yeah. What's a food elimination diet? I think it's going to be when um, you, if you've noticed something that you feel like might be causing something, you take it out of your diet and see whether or not your symptoms get better. Um, that can be kind of touch and go and kind of hit or miss and stuff. So um, I think that you can also involve those in some of those um skin prick test type things as well too, like peanuts, you know, or something like that, you know, cause you, I would, you, if you have a severe reaction to peanuts, you wouldn't want to necessarily do a food challenge test with it, you know, that is for correct. sure, you know, and stuff. So, but I know what you mean. Like if you think that you might have a, uh, a wheat sensitivity as opposed to celiac disease, it's easier to cut wheat out of your diet. See how you feel from right. maybe a couple weeks. Um, or, you know, sugar or milk, or milk, milk yeah, is another one, you know, as well. dairy type things. And so, yes, absolutely. So, and a, lo- a lot of times, you know, it's, it's, you know, there's so many things that could potentially be inside of you. That's, uh, that, that, that's could be causing you malady, uh, which is why keeping, you know, don't rely too much on your intuition. Like your intuition should inform you how you feel. Like I feel bad or I feel good. Obviously you feel things. But then, you know, go through the, keep proper documentation, find a good template of a a food elimination diet so that you can be pretty rigorous about it because it's easy to draw conclusions um, without being rigorous. So for example, um, you could eliminate, let's say you're feeling bad after eating a piece of bread, but you failed to include that you also drank a glass of wine with that piece of bread. So if you continue to eat, just cut out bread. If you don't often drink wine, then you might come to the conclusion that it was the bread that was causing you to feel that way. But then upon drinking wine again, maybe you only drink it with bread. You'll then conclude, oh, it must be the bread, but really it was the red wine. So really keep in mind that you have, you might have certain biases towards certain foods. Um, I know uh, bread out there is, is a, a common culprit for, for being uh, fairly demonized and who wants to demonize red wine because uh, it's quite delicious. But if you're really wanting to figure out what's going on with you, you also have to be aware of your biases and also biases that have been thrown at you um, by, by popular media. And I'm not saying that you might not have a gluten sensitivity or, um, but if you really want to know what's going on with your body, um, you have to highlight even the foods that, aren't highlighted by a lot of publications. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things out there could, that could potentially be a potential allergen. Um, we also talked about the food challenge, which I, 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 sim- I assume is similar, um, a, a type of way of figuring out, you know, what foods are, are good for you and which aren't. The problem is with a lot of these is that they're, they're difficult to do because food is so delicious <laughs> <laughs> and we eat so much of different types of food at a meal. So in, in order to really do this fairly scientifically, you would basically need to eat one food. You, one way I've heard about doing this is that you eliminate all foods from your diet. You almost go on a fast for a couple of days and then you reintroduce foods one at a time um, into your diet, either days or a week at a time. And then once you get to the one that causes you discomfort, then you kind of have a semblance of an idea. It's like, oh, okay, it's this one that that causes me the problem. But that's really hard to do. It's really hard to just eat kale and then do kale and broccoli, then do kale and Brussels sprouts, et cetera. But on the whole, um, one thing to really keep in mind is like if you are going to eat food, um, 
other than things that can cause like anaphylactic shock, like peanuts and things like that. Um, tend to eat foods that aren't processed. Um, try to eat a lot more colors, you know, Brussels sprouts and sweet potatoes on your plate. And if you are going to get meat, you know, make sure it's sustainably sourced. Um, because a lot of those, a lot of these additives, um, even, even though they might be safe for the whole of the population, they could be causing a, a harm for you and it, they might be that trigger. So diminishing the number of ingredients might also diminish the probability of having some of these allergic reactions. Let me add just a couple of other little points about food challenge tests. It does seem too, as I've done a little bit of additional research, that they're actually done in a controlled environment, like in, like maybe an allergist office. Uh, because I think if you did have a severe reaction, then there is medical personnel readily available to help you. But you will determine to see whether or not you've got something going on with that particular food um, under a controlled environment. Um it may be that you eat small amounts and then you have gradually increasing amounts to see what kind of a reaction you have. Um, yeah, I know that's been done with infants who have a no, because be, having a peanut allergy is, is fairly genetic and sometimes you get tested for it as an infant. And by dosing small amounts of the peanut protein that causes the allergic reaction, you can actually diminish the response. Um, it's almost kind of like an inoculation, you know, to this type of antigen or this allergen. Um, so if you have kids out there and you're worried about them getting allergies later in life, I would strongly do some research into the hygiene hypothesis and let your kids play outside and get dirty. And, um, because it really does wonders for their immune system and training it and how to moderate itself, because if it doesn't moderate itself, it can kind of go crazy. Um, so if you want to kind of delay some of these allergic responses down the road, I would highly recommend you let your kids roll in the mud a bit <laughs> within reason. Um, I think too, also just a, an additional fact about the food challenge. It seems that food challenge tests are done when you've looked at other types of tests, maybe like skin and allergy tests and, um, maybe a medical history and things seem to be inconclusive. So it's going to be kind of a down the line type of a test as well too. Okay. That's great. Okay. okay, so we've talked about some of the ways that you can prevent allergies. We've talked about how allergies can form. Now let's imagine I'm having an allergic reaction. I'm going through it. I've got, you know, puffy eyes. I've got shortness of breath, et cetera. What can I do to alleviate uh, my pain? Um, so so there's a couple of things that are, are there's a couple, a couple of, um, I guess, or there's, a I guess, treatment options for people with allergies. First thing, uh, it kind of seems like a, you know, of course, is that if you are aware of something that causes you to have an allergic reaction, you might try avoiding that thing. Like if cats are the thing that cause you to be absolutely miserable, that you can't breathe, your eyes are itching and your nose is runny all the time, you may not be able to own a cat, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so you're going to try to avoid something that might get a hairless cat. Yes. You could get a hairless <laughs> cat or let's, let's talk about dust or dust mites in your house, you know, which is in everyone's home, no matter how clean you are. I mean, so there might be some certain types of filters that you could put in your ventilation system um, in order to filter out the dust and dust mites and stuff so that you might see an improvement in your, um, in your um, uh, allergic symptoms if that happens to be the thing that's causing you problems. Um, if you, uh, you know, for, for dust and stuff as well too, keeping your house clean, you know, making sure that you don't have carpets in your house you keeping your no carpet in the home because dust 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 mites like to live in the carpet so you know hardwood floors or tile you know something that, a linoleum you know something that's not carpet would be good for that circumstance um sometimes you also want to um encase your mattress and box springs and pillows in what they call mite impermeable materials and also then wash your bedding every week. Um, if, again, this is talking about somebody who might be more sensitive to dust mites than others and stuff. Um, you know, you can also be allergic to cockroaches. Um, so you want to keep your house clean and uh, you want to keep your food tightly sealed and stored properly and then treat infested areas for co if you have problems with cockroaches. I know one time I lived in a, in a city that 
rained a whole lot more than where I live now. And so cockroaches were definitely a problem, regardless of how clean I kept my home. So again, it's just, it's not always implying that you are not a good housekeeper and stuff. It's just, sometimes it's environmental problems and stuff. Yeah. Is it something that the cockroaches excrete that you're allergic to? I believe it is. Okay. That's really interesting. Yes. Um, so, I mean, those, those, um, what you've, you've seen in this store, I've talked, I talked about putting filters into your, you know, ventilation system. They're called HEPA filters. HEPA stands for high efficiency particulate air or HEPA filter. Um, and so they're going to help try to remove pollen and mold spores and cat allergens from your household air, but they can't remove the fecal materials from house dust mites. That's what you're allergic from, from dust mites. And it, it's just too small to be filtered. And that's why they don't work for, no, for dust mites. And that's why you recommend washing your bedding. Every right. Week. Or sometimes you may have to encase it and stuff. Yeah. Yes. And mites are very small. I don't think very you'd be able small. to see them with the naked eye. Right. Correct. Right. Uh, sometimes those filters are pretty expensive and so that can be costly and stuff. And so, and they may not be effective for all patients. Also too, you can, your vacuum cleaner can also have a help, help a filter on it as well too. So it just depends on what you need that you can try some of those things. Um, if you need some medication therapy, then the, the categories that you're going to see used most commonly are going to be antihistamines decongestants, you might see some intranasal corticosteroids used. Um, there is a drug called ipratropium that is an anticholinergic, so it can dry, it, it can cause your, your nasal passages to constrict so you don't have as m- much of a runny nose if you really suffer with that. Um, sometimes uh, if you, uh, are, if, like for little kiddos that are too young to receive some of these prescription therapies, if you use um, salt water, normal saline, saline, uh, intranasal solutions or washes, that can sometimes help wash things like out. Like a neti pot. Right. Um, and sometimes people might even need oral corticosteroids as well, too. That's not as common. So the other thing, too, that you'll see um, in um, for certain circumstances is going to be um, what we call allergen immunotherapy. So you can either take, there are some oral therapies or you've got, it's when you see, hear about people getting allergy shots. So they're going to give you some of that thing that substance that you're allergic to in small amounts so that you can, your body can build up a a, a reaction to it so that when you get exposed to the real thing, you'll have a much less of a response to it as well. You'll see that a lot when you get thing, when you, um, if it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, pollen, you know, grass, that type of thing and stuff. So. Yeah, that's, that's really well said. I actually think that advice not only goes towards, getting tested for allergies. It's just good life advice in general. I think this is straying off topic a little bit, but the idea that things should always be perfect all the time and that you should never suffer from anything um, is a misnomer. I think sometimes learning how to suffer is a, a, is a great way to live through life. Feeling Also laughing through suffering is, is quite good. I remember there was a, um, there was a politician who used to, uh, he was a Navy SEAL in um, Afghanistan and he unfortunately got hit with an IUD and it knocked his eye out. Um, and, uh, and when his friend, you know, his rest of his crew came in I mean, he basically said, Oh, it's a good thing. They left me the other one, you know, it's, 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 I, immediately after getting hit with a, an IUD. Um, so this idea that there's going to be this time where things are going to function perfectly and you're going to get your house clean enough and your body is going to feel like it did when you were, you know, 10, if you're listening and you're older than 10 is not good, but it's definitely working towards getting to a place where you feel like that you're making incremental, incremental process, uh, progress. There's no, there's no, um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of the, the cure all what's the word? Yeah, there's no panacea out there that does not exist. It's all trade-offs. So if you have an allergic reaction to something, essentially you are then working to just reduce symptoms. And um, some things are better than others. Um, There's actually, I remember listening to this other podcast I listened to called Radio Lab about this man who uh, went to uh, Cameroon 
and he walked around in the latrines. If you don't know what a latrine is, uh, don't look up images, but it's essentially where people go to the restroom collectively. And it's no, there's no plumbing. It's just a pit that everyone goes to. And he walked through that pit barefoot. Um, the purpose was to get infected with this um, certain parasite called a hookworm. And a hookworm usually goes into your body and will actually attach to your small intestine. Um, it can actually can cause some pretty, um, I don't know about painful, but it can, can, can cause some severe um, digestional problems. But in the proper dose, what it did for him at least is that he had severe hay fever and he's from England and the hay fever was quite bad. And uh, we also call that allergic rhinitis. And when he went back to England after infecting himself, his allergic rhinitis had gone away. Because but based on what I said earlier about the hygiene hypothesis, his immune system had bigger problems to worry about, which was the hookworms and the allergens that they were secreting in his small intestine. And it didn't have time to worry about um, the allergens coming from the pollen, from the plants. So there's some wisdom there. There's is this idea, can we coexist with parasites or can we maybe extract the chemical from the parasite and find a way to dampen our immune system. I think it'll be, it's, it's going to be really interesting to figure out because I think a lot of people suffer from allergies, especially in richer countries, and it would be a really nice way to diminish some of their suffering. So I just wanted to bring that in, the idea that we're all just kind of figuring out the best solution here um, and don't think that things are just going to automatically just be 100% better. We're all just progressing towards some standard that we can live with. I think you can still have a rich life if you suffer, suffer from an allergy, though, because we've got a lot of options to help um, people to feel better. Um, just one extra caveat about immune therapy or immunotherapy. Um, it can take several months to, and if you're taking either these immune therapy tablets, pills, or you're getting allergy shots, it sometimes can take a couple of months before you start seeing results. So don't think immediate, you know, for that either and stuff. So yeah, we live in a world of instant gratification. Uh, biology works much slower. Yes. So give it some time. Um, and so just a couple of takeaways that I just wanted to just leave you with as far as treatments for allergies um, and, and the symptoms that happen, you know, from them. Uh, a lot of, I know a lot of these as far as things like decongestants and antihistamines, we're talking about things like, you know, itchy, watery eyes and runny nose, those types of things, rather than more serious allergic reactions. But, you know, uh, so a decongestant is going to be the type of medication that is most prompt is going to be most commonly used to manage those types of symptoms. Um, and, um, you, you know, again, are going to, um, um, if you're going to use a decongestant though, if you have some underlying diseases, like, um, if you have high blood pressure, um, or, um, glaucoma, um, even, uh, diabetes, sometimes the medications that are used to treat that can be harmful to those diseases. So it's definitely something to talk with your healthcare provider about first. I would not, um, just go ahead and take it because you could end up with some other issues if you don't, um, talk with them about, you know, how to take those and stuff with those conditions. Um, if you, um, have some other diseases that show up along with your, Oh, allergy symptoms, let's say your ears start hurting or um, you start feeling running a fever, um, you know, then um, or your um, you feel, you know, you're you have an awful cough, chest pain and you're in, in your as you cough and stuff that could th those are all some all indicators that maybe something more serious is going on. And again, you need to see a health care provider for those as well, too. That's good advice. Yeah, I remember y'all with side effects. You're you're putting a chem, especially when you take medication or anything for that matter, even food, that it's going all over your body, and wherever there is a receptor that will take that thing that you put into your body, it will fit in there like a lock and key, and it will basically start the mechanism that it was designed to do. And so, when these drugs are designed. You, you're, you're trying to target an area to alleviate suffering, aka let's use the decongestant, you want to reduce congestion. But 
upon doing the, the clinical trials, they also found out that there were other side effects. So they have to disclose these side effects. And it wasn't purposeful that these drug companies, you know, pick these side effects. They just happen to happen inside of the body. And so you tell them to the patients and say, just as a risk, be like, hey, we know you're suffering from de from congestion. Just want to let you know, if you have high blood pressure, it might not be worth the risk to take it because the side effects from this might be worse than the congestion. So that's why it's really good to know where you are at personally so that when you take drugs, you kind of can do your own risk reward uh, calculation because uh, sometimes it might not be worth it. So even though being congested isn't fun, it's also not fun to deal with you know blood pressure problems that might come as a side effect. Or you might be a patient that would then benefit for, from an intranasal corticosteroid rather than taking a decongestant because there's other options that can be used as well too to manage right. that symptom. That's well said. One other thing that I uh, just I, I neglected to say too, if you if you are um, identified as having a pretty significant allergic reaction to let's say peanuts um, or um, some other type of an aller an allergen, sometimes you will be prescribed uh, what they call um, an emergency kit, and usually it has epinephrine in it, which is something that will help to counter the um, allergen response as far as causing uh, the significant vasodilation because epinephrine is is going to cause things to constrict up and stuff. And so um, make sure that you have that available and make sure that you check the expiration date on it. Yeah. And we should mention epinephrine is a hormone that naturally occurs in your body. Um, so it is very readily used and biodegraded in your body. Um, so it's essentially there, just like my mom said, to counter the effects. So this is a this is not a foreign uh, pharmaceutical that was created. It was something that was extracted from the human body and then concentrated. Oh, and let me also add an extra point to that as well too. If if you have a situation where you do need to use the epinephrine, then you need to contact your healthcare professional. Either I mean a healthcare professional as well to let them know you know, that you had to give it or that you gave it to your child or you're on your way to the emergency room or you need to call 911, you know, as well too. If you're, if you're seeing really like somebody's having really difficulty breathing, um, have a really crazy heart rate or whatever and you need some help as well too. So. Yeah. So when you walk out, you know, you'll have your keys, wallet, phone, and your EpiPen. Just one thing to add to your repertoire. Right. Absolutely. So. Well, fantastic. I was, so I'll just do a little overview. So we've got um, allergies, which are caused by allergens getting into your body. And normally they would do nothing, but every now and then they're going to cause a little haywire, whether that's, you know, essentially causing your immune system to kick into gear and um, cause some of the effects that the immune system would normally do when fighting an infection from a bacteria and virus, which is causing vasodilation, which causes swelling, or um, even releasing histamines, which do the similar thing, Bron uh, bronchoconstriction, which causes your tightening of your chest, and also increasing mucus production, which can cause you to feel quite stuffy. Um, and also sometimes even swelling in your eyes or even in your ears, or and sometimes in even worse cases, like mom said, you can develop hives all throughout your body, or sometimes the, you know your throat can close up so much that you might even suffocate. Um, and that's, and we call that anaphylactic shock, um, when the, the, when the allergy is really bad. So, uh, in order to avoid this, like my mom said, you want to avoid the allergen altogether if you know it. Um, and that can be done by, like you said, if it has to do with pets, don't have pets or try to limit your exposure to them. And if you have to be exposed to them, um, it might be good to have a filter in your house that can filter out some of this dander and also maybe potentially find a way to um, expose yourself slowly to this dander so maybe you can build up an immune tolerance. Uh, there's no guarantees there. Um, it definitely helps if you're younger um, because your immune system is more adaptable. Uh, but if you're older, it might be good to try to build up some tolerance there. So, but when you have the allergic reaction, when you're actually suffering through something, it's good to um, take things like decongestants, antihistamines, and sometimes even things like Tylenol, uh, because some of the swelling can be caused by prostaglandins, which if you want to take uh, Tylenol, it can reduce um, the prevalence of those prostaglandins and reduce some of the pain um, that is happening inside of your body. Um, 
Professor Seltzer, did I gather everything that you said or do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'm not sure that, let me just double check. I, I mean, you could take something like ibuprofen to reduce prostaglandins, but I think oh, Tylenol I was wrong. has yeah. a different mechanism. You're right. It's Tylenol really is for the pain. One with, Tylenol and, is just blocks the, the neural pathway. Right. And ibuprofen is, is the prostaglandin. Thank you. I appreciate swelling. the correction. Yes. So. See, it's good to be wrong because then you find out what's right. So, <laughs> um, and also too, just uh, and one extra little caveat is that you know there are there are now two kind of classes of antihistamines. Those first generation antihistamines cause a lot more sedation, but we have the newer non sedating antihistamines, things that you're really familiar with, things like Allegra or Claritin, um, and uh, if you need to function during the day, I would suggest a non-sedating antihistamine Most of us do. and save those sedating antihistamines if you need to use them in the evening time. That's good to know. And do you suggest any decongestants that, that you prefer that you like? Um, I think that all of the, I mean, I'd, I, you know, probably, you know, Afrin or the Afrin generics are, are just fine. You know, any of those in that area are just going to be fine. And they you would look on the back of the box and look for Afrin if you're looking for a it, decongestant. Well, I think that the, uh, the generic name for Afrin is oxymetolazine. I think. Let me just double check that. Hold on. Yes, ox oxymetolazine is. Uh, no, I'm sorry, oxymetazoline is the generic name for Afrin. And so, okay, so if I, mean, I see oxymetazoline, right, then that's a that's a decongestant. That is like a decongestant, yes, and stuff. So it's you, you it's over the counter, you know, in in the grocery stores and pharmacies and stuff. So. Okay. Is okay. that different than mucinex? Yes, mucinex is totally different. Mucinex is for cough. Um, it has a an expectorant in it, and if it if the dextromethorphan is in it, then it's got a cough suppressant, and it. it's totally for cough. Gotcha. Okay, so. that's great. Um, well, y'all, this has been a lot, and there's a lot to learn about allergies and um, how your immune system. Um, interacts. It's not very straightforward. Um, so we hope that you don't mind us not giving very straightforward answers. The mechanism can be so different. Like we said, there's four different mechanisms for, um, you know, allergic responses, uh, but to treat the conditions um, is, is fairly consistent. Um, so we hope that some of this information is super helpful to y'all. Um, and we hope that you get some relief, especially when you're going through uh, an allergy season or an allergy episode. Um, so until next time, um, my name is Josh Klaus and I'm Jennifer Seltzer and thanks for listening to another episode of your mom on drugs.